Peter Marks puckered up on a packet ship in port at Liverpool to blow over a slat of his new bunk. It was dusty. A cloud of dust billowed. So, squinting, Peter took out a handkerchief and went to work. Old habits are comforting, and Peter needed comfort badly. In less than 24 hours, Peter had gone from atop the world, running England's most popular, gentlemanly, upper-class, best-catered, and kept Molly House pub, then down through a labyrinth of his various lives, blowing to pieces, ending up at this bunk two feet below deck in the corner of a sailor's quarters. Answering a help-wanted sign, Peter Marks was a new apprentice to this boat's shipsmith. A creature of old habits, he made his cramped nook instantly clean, tolerable, and livable. Another one of Peter's lifetimes just came and went last night, then again this afternoon, and so America would be his next escape plan from himself. Peter surrendered once more to the forces of the cotton cosmos, this time boarding a packet ship upon which the whole of international capital rested. The seas proceeded to cake Peter Marks in his own dust. Welcome to the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour, only on Midwestern Marks. I'm Tim Russo, the author of the Star Wars series for leftists, Ghosts of Plum Run. Uh, Thanks for that cold open listen, if you're still here. Uh, We tried a cold open just to bring the peeps in. So today, what we're going to do is, we're in Chapter 6, Peter and St. Paul, how Peter Marx gets from Europe to America as an immigrant. The only record of Peter Marx uh, uh, in, in, that I could find were his death at Gettysburg from wounds in the charge on July 2nd, 1863. He died two weeks later and is buried at Gettysburg. And the record of his appearance on the 1857 census in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, which included his birth in Prussia. Uh, making him the right age, just about to be a 48, 1848 revolutionary. And today we're going to get into love stories. And one of the reasons uh, Peter ends up being bisexual, in addition to me being bisexual, which makes it easier to write, um, is to tell the story of uh, the 1848 or immigrant revolutionaries uh, through love stories. Love stories are the best way to tell a story. Uh, from time immemorial. And uh, that's why we are getting into some uh, romance today. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with Peter getting on the boat, um, running from his 1848 revolutionary exile and himself. By summer of 1857, another global serpent, a three-legged shipping triangle in the Atlantic Ocean, moved slave-harvested cotton from southern American ports to Liverpool, then shipped immigrants from Liverpool to New York, then fuel and manufactured goods back to southern ports. Of course, like the slave trade triangle before it, the essential leg of the stool was the cotton, which bore no labor cost, thus was the most profitable, thus propped up the whole of international trade. Without a third of the stool's support relying on no-cost labor, there would be no stool for the world economy to sit on, let alone a route for immigrants to America like Peter Marks. To ship captains, the immigrant leg was the worst of the entire affair and the least profitable. What a mess. In Liverpool, all the wretched refuse of stinking, impoverished, desperate people replaced the no-maintenance cotton bales filling the ship. Nothing about the westward voyage made economic sense other than the immigrants' ticket price barely paying for a crew to get back to America and pick up more no-labor-cost cotton. Even the leg from New York south along the American coast with textiles or stoves or fancy dresses to New Orleans or Mobile Bay or Charleston was a chore compared to cotton bales. The ship's crews yearned to pull into a southern port as much as they hated pulling into Liverpool. Often, shipmates had to be replaced in Liverpool, especially the less skilled laborers at the bottom of a ship's crew, who had had enough of one journey on a disgusting ship filled with immigrants and could not stomach another. That summer of 1857... One such ship's blacksmith lost his apprentice, who collected his pay in his adventure, then took his leave. So, a European refugee, fleeing his previous life as an 1848 revolutionary, like Peter Marx, could easily find passage in exchange for work. Yet again, defeat at the hands of capital spit its victory over Peter's revolution into his face. Now, nine years on from waving the Communist Manifesto in the air as a teenager... Peter was 25 years old when he boarded a sailing ship in Liverpool, answering the sign needing a shipsmith's apprentice. Crossing the gangway over the water of the port, Peter felt all his previous lives dissolve behind him on the English shore. He'd left his parents in Prussia to change the world in 1848, fled into the mountains of Switzerland, was chased across Europe to exile in England where he fell in love with a boy who broke his heart, 
then fell in love with a girl who broke his heart, and then been a footman, a barman, building little lives that all exploded in catastrophically complicated smithereens all around him over and over. There was no nostalgia for any of it. His life had been turned upside down so repeatedly, the gangway bouncing under Peter's feet felt like a mystic entrance onto a time machine that erased it all. Europe's thicket of endless strife faded behind the ship as it floated into the horizon of endless sea, America beyond. Peter felt like he could breathe again. Steamships had begun overtaking sailing ships by 1857, which cut the Atlantic crossing to two weeks, sometimes less. By sail, it took more than a month longer on a packet ship. Thus, steam crossings were for the wealthy. Freight, mail, and immigrants still relied on a canvas sail to catch the wind just right. For those six weeks, immigrants lived in steerage, the deck just above the cargo hold, packed in like sardines on bunks, barely separated enough to keep from suffocating in your sleep. <clears throat> above steerage were the crew's quarters, also cramped, but at least you got your own bed. There, Peter was given a tiny nook in an upper bunk, his face inches from the underside of the deck as he slept. Peter cocooned in his bunk from the first day at sea. It felt safe to lie there, curled up in a crawl space, the ship's motion calming, the creaks of the old wooden lady singing him to sleep every night. He burrowed against the wall of his cabin, crowded with crew, to hide and heal. Peter kept his bunk spotlessly clean, putting to work for himself, for once, all his lessons from previous lives keeping others' living spaces comfortable. After a week, anywhere inside the ship smelled so horrible, <clears throat> Peter began staying on the deck as late as he could, leaning out over the railing, breathing the sea air, gazing at stars carpeting the ocean sky. Peter was anonymous crew and liked it that way, keeping to himself his cocoon, his bunk, and his thoughts. No sailor. Peter learned right away he wouldn't learn much blacksmithing. Though it was a very old ship, metal needed smithing only rarely. If a metal repair was needed, it was urgent, so the shipsmith would summon Peter to the fire hot to keep the fire hot while he banged away. In the meantime, Peter's labor was mainly used for basic duties, swabbing the deck, fixing sails, typing, tying ropes. A routine set in, the ocean itself a cocoon in which Peter began his metamorphosis from a European to an American. By New York, Peter looked every bit the grizzled seaman as he disembarked into his new country for shore leave. Six weeks of beard covering his face, his once boyish charm buried under hair that hadn't been cut for months. Somehow, he'd avoided the variety of disease one deck below his bunk in steerage, so it was as healthy as he'd ever been. Hard labor made Peter a rock-solid specimen of a man. The last time Peter was in such perfect physical shape, he'd marched 20 miles a day into the Swiss mountains in the Revolution nine years ago, a teenager. It would have been easy for Peter to walk off the ship and disappear into New York City. But New York reminded him too much of Europe. Everywhere were Irishmen and Germans, the t city teeming with refugees and immigrants flooding out of every steerage of every boat that put into port. There were too many German newspapers, too many people speaking German. New York City hit Peter Mark square in the face, so after one day of it, he retreated back to his bunk on the ship. His metamorphosis was not yet complete. America was big enough for Peter to vanish away from his past such that he'd never hear anyone speak German again, Peter thought. So Peter stayed aboard to New Orleans, where the ship would pick up bales of cotton and leave Peter Marks on American soil for good. As the ship neared New Orleans, the pace of Peter's run from his past quickened within him to a race. Two days out, Peter told the captain his plans. Counting his pay for the two months at sea, Peter decided to splurge on a steamboat passage deeper into America. He laundered the fancier clothes he wore boarding back in Liverpool two months ago to perfection, then packed them. A riverboat docked right next to his ship in the New Orleans port, so Peter never even set foot in Louisiana. He merely jumped across onto the steamboat with his pay in his bag. Peter paid for passage as far as the steamboat could go to St. Paul, Minnesota, <clears throat> at the top of the Mississippi River, the last stop. He treated himself to his own berth, first class, its own bathroom, marching to the door on the second floor of the steamboat along the balcony, swinging the door open with a burst, tossing his bag on the bed, then catching himself in the room's full-length mirror just as the steamboat's whistle blew for departure. Seeing himself froze Peter solid. The steam whistle blew. Peter looked in the mirror. Two months of seafaring presented a filthy, hairy beast he barely recognized. Peter stared briefly, then hurled himself into the bath, shaving away his, his beard, chopping his hair behind his neck just so, scrubbing, polishing himself, primping, and preening. <clears throat> there he was again. Dripping wet and naked, he went back to the mirror. There he was again, the boyish, perfect Prussian Peter, Prince Peter. <clears throat> 
He took a deep breath, stepping to the mirror to touch it as if touching his own face to see if it was all real. In a flurry, he dressed in his clean, fancy clothes and stood in the mirror again to see who was there this time. Proper, pressed, Prussian prince Peter Marks looked back. He adjusted his ascot and spun round to step out onto the balcony. There the sun began to set westward over the Louisiana bayou, crickets and frogs of a late summer evening on the Mississippi putting Peter into an American trance. Emerging from his cocoon, the butterfly he once was, the paddle wheel pushing him further into his new home, home, Peter finally relaxed. He made it, Peter thought. I'm here, and that's all gone. Peter hid in his berth on the steamboat all the way north, rarely being seen except for meals or to lean against the boat rail watching the river go by. Passengers referred to him as that boy in the most expensive room. He tipped the crew enough to be left alone, where he mostly slept all day and all night, resting the entire two-week journey north, deep rest, so needed and so welcome. Mystery enveloped Peter once more, and within Peter's mind, it within it Peter's mind began again became curious. He read newspapers for the first time in a while. Learning his timing was, as usual, poor. He'd landed smack dab in the middle of the panic of 1857. Two months ago, when he departed Liverpool, America was a speculator's paradise. Now, where he was going, St. Paul, Minnesota, was an epicenter of land speculation-driven bubble gone bust. Rumor of ruin filled the steamboat northward. It was mid-September when Peter stepped off at St. Paul's upper landing, a shadow of its recent glory. No longer was St. Paul the boomtown of the frontier. The record arrivals of the previous two years were gone now. Only a trickle of passengers filed ashore, and those who did wondered why they bothered. Peter stood at the landing with his bag, taking in his journey's terminus, the bluff above him leading into town, when the sound of German spoken startled him. Peter turned to see a few men talking to a newspaper man handing out broadsheets in German print. Stunned, <clears throat> Peter bought a copy of the Minnesota Stats Zeitung, the most important of Minnesota's half dozen or so German language newspapers. Peter snapped it open to inspect it. Indeed, the newspaper was in German, filled with news of Germans. Just perfect. Gazing around, exasperated, Peter wondered how far into America one had to travel to avoid Europeans. Why didn't he just stay in New York? He folded the newspaper away into his jacket pocket, then marched up the bluff into St. Paul's Upper Town, kicking himself the whole way. He felt so foolish. It was stupid to isolate like a wounded child the entire trip, he decided. Anyone could have told him where the immigrants all ended up. As he walked, he opened the Stotch Zeitung to let his foolishness leap to mock him from every line he, wet, he read. Blindly hurling himself through America had landed him in a place so filled with Germans, their newspaper told Peter they were electing themselves to public office, opening breweries, saloons, hotels, banks, many of which were just now going out of business. He'd fallen into a little Deutschland. Peter just kept on into Upper Town reading the paper as he walked, looking up from it only to ask himself how he could be so dumb. He could have jumped off the steamboat anywhere, got on a horse, and rode in any direction for any distance and found fewer Germans. Thus, Peter's first day in St. Paul began, until all he could do was laugh at himself. Cherry on top, St. Paul's economic collapse had already begun emptying the town. Everywhere Peter walked, people were packing wagons, stores were selling out their inventory, panicked businessmen were in streets desperately trying to cut deals to minimize the damage all their pyramid land schemes were wrecking for miles out into the prairie <clears throat> the air boiled with worry and peter could feel it his wanderings brought him to lower town by sundown where peter learned st paul's main thoroughfare third street was a saloon paradise watering holes and one atop the other filled with the dread of imminent disaster arguments shouting out the windows of them brawls occasionally bursting out of them ladies at the front doors of brothels announcing discounts to passers-by Frontier Saloon Village from its inception, the Panic of 1857 turned St. Paul into one giant rolling 24-hour liquor swoon session, Exodus, its fuel. Like the day nine years ago he arrived at the docks in Liverpool, Peter took it all in, walking with his bag down 3rd Street, when a prostitute called to him from her perch above, leaning over the balcony of a whorehouse. Betty Posey had spotted his new fel this new fellow standing out like a jewel, wandering aimlessly down 3rd Street and watched him walk. She'd taken to leaning over her balcony to stare at life going by since the panic hit, falling into the cycle of regret so many on the frontier suddenly could not escape. Born 20 years ago to a mother who didn't survive childbirth and a saloon-keeping father, Betty Posey was raised in St. Paul's boozy, brothel-soaked beginnings. By age 10, her father had disappeared into the frontier, chasing one dream or another, and St. Paul's boom years had begun. 
Left to be raised in the saloons, Betty's teenage years were spent under the tutelage of St. Paul's leading madams who taught Betty how to keep herself separated from the hospitality she provided in order to survive. The boom years showered Betty with security and permanence, so when it all went poof, the regrets began, the questions, the what-ifs. All she had now was the little spot on 3rd Street in a, pla- in a place careening into oblivion, and her exceptional beauty, statuesque, tall, long, blonde hair, and deep blue eyes. On her balcony in those days, Betty wondered whether to light out further west, following the exodus to find a man to settle down with who could hunt, build a cabin, stay safe from the natives, build a farm for her. Then she'd circle right back to resignation to stay in St. Paul, realizing it wasn't really so bad. At least she controlled her life around her here on 3rd Street, enough to survey passing gentlemen such that this one boy, obviously new to town, could be plucked out of the crowd when she laid her eyes upon his boyish, rather princely presence. My goodness, you're a cute one, Betty Posey shouted at Peter below, who, looking up, just chuckled to himself. You right, right, right there. As Betty disappeared from the balcony above him, Peter knew she'd spotted him as a new new arrival, which meant he had money in his pocket, which separated him from every suddenly penniless pauper in town. A sitting duck, Peter had to decide whether to carry on and ignore her or just roll with whatever came his way. <clears throat> when Betty bounded out of the front door of her brothel, Flip, frills flowing this way and that. Peter decided, what the hell, I'd, and bowed to the lady. <clears throat> Madam, Peter said, removing his hat. They don't make them like you around here, Betty proclaimed with delight. She grimly looked around at the mayhem in every direction. Well, not anymore, anyway. Where are you from, handsome? The steamboat landing up north, Peter replied. Betty struck a curious pose and hands on her hips. How old are you? Betty insisted, arrested by Peter's youthful beauty. My goodness, a boy your age just off the river. I bet you're quite a story. Quite a story, Peter thought. She can say that again. How old was he? Peter paused, wondering how much of his life he could erase by lying about his age. He pondered. What age was I before all, everything all went to hell? Peter looked around nervously as Betty played with a tuft of his hair in the street. You can't be more than 16 years old, maybe 17. 21, ma'am, Peter lied, shaving four years off his existence, just like that. No. And what's that accent? English, ma'am, Peter lied again. This time, Betty wasn't fooled. Do I look deaf to you? Betty scolded. You know you're in a town full of Germans, don't you? I got ears on me. Peter smiled, allowing fate to carry him. I'm Peter, and you are? Betty Posey, she announced, assuming her most glamorous introduction posture. I'm the madam of Posey's playpen right there. She pointed at her balcony above the street. Why don't you let me show you around, Mr. Mm, 21-year-old Englishman, you say? Peter played along, pulling the German newspaper out of his lapel pocket he'd picked up at the landing, handing it to Betty, who took one look at it. Funny look in English, he said. You're right. It's a German accent, Peter said, and I'd be honored if you'd show me around, Miss Posey. And such a polite boy you are, but it's Betty, she said, snapping the newspaper playfully on Peter's head. Now come on, and off they went. Peter's two-month journey across the ocean finally ended by a lady of the night. How'd you get so adorable? Betty flirted endlessly as they walked. Posey's playpen? Peter asked. Oh, everyone's got to have a gimmick around here, Betty admitted. You don't like it? I just want to remember it, Peter replied. Easy to remember. How's business? Peter asked. My word, you are an interesting young fellow, aren't you? Just curious. Well, if you must know, I'm taking every man's last penny in this town because they're all completely shattered and need companionship in their sorrows. So I arrived at just the right time, Peter moaned. What business are you in, Betty asked, now just as curious about Peter as he was about her. Something about this boy. She watched his gait, how he walked, seemed proper, but resigned, as if he'd just told a joke on himself whose punchline he didn't much like. Oh, we'll see, Peter said. Betty laughed. Well, I got news for you, you handsome devil. There's a whole lot, whole lot of we'll see going on in St. Paul these days. You landed in a town flooded full of we'll see. The Betty Posey tour of St. Paul carried onward. Stopping for dinner at the American House Hotel on Main Street, the two fast friends shared a steak, (coughs) Peter keeping his secrets and Betty looking for them. This is the first proper hotel in town, Pete, Betty announced as the bread course arrived at the table. I could get you a room. Owner likes me, she buttered her bread. I do appreciate your time, Betty, but I'm afraid I'm not going to be a customer for you tonight, Peter said. Oh, you're not business. Your pleasure, Betty seduced. Besides, Have to eat, so might as well eat with the prettiest new boy in town. Dinner is on me, Peter insisted. You seem like you waited tables once, Betty deduced. You could say that. 
then you know I need a break anyway, Betty decided, finally relaxing for the evening. This town needs more brothels. That's one business that ain't going to die around here, and they're all keeping Posey's playpen a bit too busy. Oh, waiter, we'll have a couple of whiskeys here. Thank you. <clears throat> Peter rolled his eyes. What a way to land in America. You're the first American I've really spoken to, Betty, <clears throat> Peter said. Did you really just get off the boat, she said. Two months at sea, two weeks on that river, Peter said proudly, snapping his napkin to his lap properly. I touched dry land in New York briefly. Why St. Paul? Farthest place I could get to in a boat. Delightfully, they dined, Betty using her status as a local celebrity of sorts to give Peter the American House Hotel's dining room's first-class treatment that he had to pay for on the steamboat. A pro at it, Betty tried everything to get Peter's guard down, and a pro in the other direction, Peter kept it cordial. After two hours, a passerby could mistake them for old friends. There's a lot of Germans here like you, Pete, Betty said. <clears throat> Peter despaired. Still frustrated, he couldn't escape fully. He took a deep breath, sat back, crossed his legs, and let his frustration show, finally. How is that possible? They all had the same idea as you, dummy, Betty replied. Statehood's going to make a lot of folks rich next year. Well, at least it was. And if I keep going out onto that prairie, there's still going to be Germans out there? Honey, every frontier town west of the Mississippi has a German newspaper. How do you know? I'm in the hospitality business, sugar, Betty said proudly. Just a hotel with entertainment. You should have got off in St. Louis. That town is filled with Germans. By the after-dinner glasses of port, Betty's curiosity went where Peter had been waiting for it to go since they met. He was prepared. We're going to break here and talk about uh, 1848ers and sexuality. So the reason, um, another reason why uh, I created uh, a bisexual character out of Peter Marks uh, is he seemed uh, to lie to the census taker in 1857. He told the census taker in 1857 that he was 21. However, uh, those four years that uh, he disappeared from the census taker show up in the muster roll of the first Minnesota in 1861, where uh, he, uh, he, he tells the, 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 uh, the regiment that he's actually 29 years old when he gets to, or I think it's 29, I have to look it up, but he did lie to the census taker. Either he lied to the census taker or he lied to uh, the regiment when he enlisted. Um, so we're not really actually sure when Peter was born. So another reason is in 1848, during the revolution, uh, sexuality and marriage were an issue uh, that the 48ers believed marriage was a capitalist oppression, a form of capitalist oppression. So there are many 48ers whose, uh, whose romantic lives, whose sexual lives were wide open. Uh, we're going to talk about one of them uh, at some point, uh, the uh, famous 1848 uh, lady, Annika, uh, Fritz Annika's wife, um, and... Um, We've got a guest lined up for that, but it was kind of a free love thing. So uh, it's very likely that 48ers who made their way to America had this little uh, kink in their sexuality. Um, and here we have Betty Posey, who uh, I created as a uh, as Peter's entry into St. Paul, kind of figuring it out. Um, and we're going to we're going to get back to the American House Hotel. By the way, the American House Hotel is the first proper hotel that was in St. Paul and it, it, at the time it, it was probably the best hotel in 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 St. Paul. So let's get back to that. Let's see. Steak at the American House. Okay, here we go. Page 165. So, Betty coyly began twirling her port glass, leaning back in her chair. You know I'll keep all those these secrets of yours you want forgotten. What secrets, Peter asked, smiling, taking a sip of the port. You know, Pete, I'm not used to men spending more than an hour with me with their clothes on. Oh, Betty, I'm just a boy. You said so yourself, Peter played along. Are you one of those? One of what? Oh, come now, am I going to have to order more whiskey? Peter gave in a bit. Ask yourself, Betty, Peter toyed. Why would a pretty boy like myself limit his options to just one of the sexes? Peter raised his port glass with a wink. Betty gasped. I never thought of it that way, Betty said. Maybe I should. And you, Peter asked. Me what? Betty played along. 
Waiter, more whiskey for the lady, Peter gestured to the fellow paying attention to their table. Betty laughed, and they stared into each other's eyes a moment. It's just business, Betty said. Well, you guessed right, Miss Posey. My heart's been broken by both. I knew it, she cried, slamming the table. You Germans always have to be so very different all the time. Does your heart break, madam? Peter asked. Just business, Betty sang back. For a while there, I believed marriage was a form of oppression, Peter hinted. Fought for it, too. It was the first clue Betty, Peter gave Betty that he was in exile from 1848's reddest of the red revolutions. Betty ignored it entirely. Well, judging by my book of business, most of the men in this town think marriage is an oppression, too. And some of the women, they laughed and laughed. It was a fun game, Betty prying, Peter preventing, out into the street again by nightfall. Where are you staying tonight, Betty asked as they strolled. You were going to get me a reservation at the American house, no? Peter said. There's room at the playpen any time, Betty said, this time with no hint of flirting. You'll stay there tonight. We can put you in the attic for as long as you need. They turned a corner, and there was Henry Shearn's headquarters to Oyster Shack, a ramshackle house turned saloon at Uppertown, practically alone by itself near weed-overgrown fields where streets were imagined to have been planted onto subdivisions before the panic. After the panic, Shearn's Oyster Shack seemed to be one of the weeds. Night had fallen upon a boisterous crowd of St. Paul's suddenly hopeless cast adrift on a sea of international financial collapse. Peter held the door for Betty, who pranced into Shearn's Oyster Shack like a queen, every man in the packed saloon bursting to drunken applause, Betty bowing this way and that. Peter followed, overwhelmed by it all, pushing through the crowd, when Betty sat four stools down from an Irish boy at the bar whose messy red hair cracked Peter's impregnable defenses, shattering his night. Two, please, Betty told the barkeep, then noticed Peter off in his little galaxy, staring at the red-haired boy four stools down the bar. A man played fiddle in the corner, and the boy turned from glaring at the musician to glaring at the owner behind the bar. Henry, the Irish boy said, why you let those half-breeds in here? He plays Irish songs too, Henry Shearn dismissed, wiping down the bar. I don't want no trouble in here tonight, Seamus, you hear? Seamus shook his head and on one turn caught someone staring at him from down the bar, Peter, who caught himself staring. Then both nervously looked away after a bolt of lightning passed between their eyes, electric to both of them. Seamus pounded a shot, slamming his glass on the bar. Betty, being a professional at such matters, caught the entire half second of excitement, knowing it all instantly. She turned to Peter. What was his name? She asked. Who? What? What sort of music is that? Peter asked, still in his own cosmos. Métis, Betty answered. French trappers gave Indian girls a baby, and that's a Métis. He's playing the Red River Jig, one of their songs. Betty began bobbing to the music, up, down, side to side. Nice, isn't it? It's wonderful, Peter said. His feet tapped to the rhythm on the bar stool. The music was infectious, as if beating with his own heart, which pounded at the sight of that boy down the bar and the memories. Tap, tap, tap went Peter's feet until he asked Betty, why don't we dance? In a whirl, Peter whisked Betty to her feet as the Red River Jig carried them away, circling with the crowd, the Métis fiddler accelerating. Abruptly, the fiddler stopped, then started, each cycle of stops and starts injecting more fever into the dance. The crowd ate it up, Métis crooked rhythm in control. Then the fiddler leapt onto a table for another stop, then another start, began with thumping his feet on the table. The fiddler seemed a kind of sorcerer, summoning Shearn's oyster shack to throb with life on his command, despite the world around it crumbling. The Irish boy at the bar just stared into his whiskey. We're going to pause really quickly here and tell you who Seamus is. Um, Seamus is uh, very, uh, is much more uh, described in volume one. Seamus, uh, gets to St. Paul with his Uncle Patty, uh, who teaches our heroine, who we haven't met yet, Millie, uh, how to play violin, fiddle. Um, and Seamus was a little kid uh, who survived the Irish potato famine, but his family did not. So his uncle dragged him across the sea. Um, so he is, he's sort of a vehicle, Seamus is sort of a vehicle for the Irish uh, immigrant story. Having survived the famine as a child, uh, and his Uncle Paddy, we imply in Volume 1 that Uncle Paddy was at least aware of the 1848 revolution in uh, Ireland, which which gave the Union Army <laughs> uh, a bunch of 48ers, uh, Irish 48ers, who formed uh, the Irish Brigade, led by Thomas Marr, famously. Uh, but that's all another story. 
Uh, but Seamus is kind of an interesting character, and he kind of comes and goes. And if you want to learn more about Seamus' backstory, Volume 1 is the place to do it. Um, but uh, Peter runs into Seamus uh, through Betty Posey here at Henry Shearn's Oyster Shack. One final stop, then start, boiling the bar to crescendo. The fiddler finally drew out a long note, and applause erupted, the fiddler taking his bow on the table and jumping off it. Betty huffed and puffed, hurling herself back onto the bar stool, exhausted by the Red River jig. Peter landed with a thud next to her. Where'd you learn to dance so well, Peter? Betty asked. Oh, picked it up here and there. Now answer my question, she said. What question, Peter asked, stealing another glimpse at the red-haired Irish boy down the bar who reminded him of everything he wanted to forget. The name of the boy who broke your heart, Betty insisted with a knowing nod. Honey, that fellow over there took you into a daze, she whispered. Finally, Peter understood, smiled, then began to surrender. Every strand of his life crashed into itself and each other. Running from it all was pointless and now so tiring, the futility breathed a sigh out of Peter. (sighs) Oh, it doesn't matter, does it, Peter said. Paul. His name was Paul, and I end up in a place called St. Paul, Peter laughed, filled with Germans. And he looks like Paul. There. Happy now? Now it was Betty's turn to understand. Ah, I see, Betty nodded, letting a pause hover. Was I that obvious, Peter asked. Been in this business quite a while, Pete. Someday I'll, t- someday I'll tell you all about it, maybe, Peter said. Betty could tell he was at the end of his rope, so ruffled that tuft of his hair she liked so much. You've had a long journey, Pete. Here, save my seat. Betty said, popping off her stool to march over to the Irish boy who hated half-breeds, holding his own against a half-bottle of whiskey. Perfect, Peter thought. Just perfect. As the pit fiddler summoned Irish hearts with a slow lament to give everyone a rest after his Métis jig brought the house down, Peter threw back a shot to dizzy himself, surveying the crowd in Shearn's oyster shack. It was all too much, all of a sudden. There'd be no escaping his past, Peter admitted to himself. Two months at sea won't do it and two lifetimes anywhere wouldn't either. Peter let Upper Town Saloon life wash over his haze in those moments alone on a bar stool, Betty working her magic down the bar, Peter laughing to himself, shaking his head, melancholy mixing with anticipation, then with regret, then again with possibility, promise, potential. Suddenly, the Irish boy walked by in a rush, out the door. Betty returned, perky as could be. What are you up to? Peter asked. Next door, Betty replied, paying for drinks. Come on, he's waiting. She winked, yanking Peter out of his malaise, off his bar stool, out the door of the saloon, to a house next door with a sign in a window that read, Lusty Lulu's. Betty ushered him in, shouting, Where's he at, Lulu? Upstairs, a voice called from the kitchen. Betty walked Peter to the bedroom upstairs, where a whirlwind of unbridled passion between the three of them filled the rest of the night. The next morning, Peter awoke, alone in bed, Betty preening herself for the coming day. An unmistakable aroma of wanton sex permeating the bedsheets scrunched up around him in the upstairs room filled with the sunlight of morning. (sighs) Where am I, Peter yawned. Good morning, uh, Betty beamed, bustling about. Coffee's a brewing. Busying herself with dressing, Betty tossed Peter's shirt at him from a chair. That was some performance. Come on, Lulu is waiting. We get cleaned up. Who's Lulu? This is her place, Betty explained. We madams take care of each other, when I'm in Upper Town and when she's in Lower Town. Rubbing confusion from his eyes, Peter looked around from the pillow. Where's... Oh, he's long gone, Betty laughed, racing around the room. (laughs) Ha, that boy's a dime a dozen. Sweet little things saving themselves for their wedding night, which never happens because the whole town goes belly up. That kind skedaddles before sunup, poor kid, Betty said, leaning over the bed to kiss Peter on the forehead. You handled that boy so, so well, she whispered in his ear. Peter waved off the incoming smooch. Water, Peter shouted, rolling off the bed, stumbling to his feet. I'll be downstairs. Hurry along, Betty demanded, leaving Peter to his hangover, his morning after, and his bewildered first morning in St. Paul. Molly houses, the regal madam of the house, Lulu, said to Betty, pouring herself coffee at the breakfast table downstairs. That's what they call them in England, Molly houses. That's where that boy learned all that. A Molly house is for the boys, Betty asked. How fancy. Judging from the hell of a racket you three made last night, Lulu scolded, I'd say your new friend spent some time in one. A queen of St. Paul's brothel scene, Lulu had semi-retired to Uppertown, where things were quieter than on 3rd Street. Her age wasn't showing much, but it was there. Lulu could feel it now. 
Betty was Lulu's heir apparent, the playpen handed down by Lulu for younger hands to manage. Lulu needed her sleep these days, and last night got none. That Irish boy has a set of lungs on him, don't he, Lulu? Why do you think I'm having breakfast at this hour, Lulu said, tapping a hard boiled egg with a spoon. You rascals kept me up all night. I heard that, boy. I sure did. My goodness me. Peter was very quiet, Betty remembered fondly, twirling her hair at the table. What were you two doing to that boy? Oh, that was Peter's job, Betty smiled. Probably scared half the neighborhood, Lulu said. I'm sure the whole thing was uneventful for Peter, said Betty. Europeans, they're always so above everything, Betty giggled. But that one, Peter, hmm, he's above something, all right. Boring is what you get here, Lulu said. All these men pretending to hold out for wedding night, rolling into the playpen. Predictable as the sun rising in the east tomorrow, Lulu lamented. Most of them are just hard work. Wasn't hard work last night, Lulu. You're lucky I didn't barge in there and join you. Betty gasped. What an honor that would have been. Almost did. Why didn't you? I know that Irish boy. Oh, Lulu, we know everyone in this town. Yes, but he's trouble. Always getting in fights and scraps, putting on airs like he'll be a tycoon on this here prairie like every other one of them does. Not anymore, they don't. No, they don't, Lulu declared, pausing the tapping of her hard-boiled egg to set down the spoon with a snap. Not no more. And they're all a-coming to lusty Lulus in the playpen with their boring sex. Wedding night ain't happening. Done lost the family fortune, so me and you get a highway of virgins who haven't the first clue. She picked up the spoon and resumed tapping her egg. That Irish boy last night wasn't boring. You heard it yourself, Lulu. He's going to remember all that. Oh, he sure will. Betty had to fan herself in her chair. Ain't no use getting mixed up with that boy, said Lulu. Peter sure got mixed up in that boy. Betty laughed. I'm getting too old for that, Lulu declared. I think you could use a boy like that here. Which one? Peter, the German. For what? Lulu asked. Bartender, why not? Honey, I ain't in Lower Town in the middle of 3rd Street anymore. Why do you think I handed it off to you? Up here, he'd just be overhead, especially nowadays. Peter stepped down the stairs. I see the welcoming committee has my life all planned out already. Peter announced, stepping down the stairs carefully, squinting his throbbing eyes at the brightness of morning, entering the breakfast room only slightly disheveled. This is Lulu, Peter, Betty announced. The pleasure is mine, Peter bowed. Please pardon my... Oh, your hangover ain't special around here. Welcome to St. Paul, Peter. You can pass me the salt. Lulu pried the shell off the top of the egg, then turned to see Peter for the first time and suddenly understood Betty's entire evening. You got a last name, gorgeous? This boy keeps to himself, Betty's told Lulu. Tried to convince me he was English. Peter in St. Paul has quite a ring to it, Lulu noticed. Betty shushed her passing the salt. Sore subject, Lulu, Betty noted. Marks, madam, Peter Marks, with a K-S, not an X, Peter insisted as Betty smirked. Mr. Marks, you're welcome here any time, but you must know, Lulu advised, wagging a finger with one hand, salting her egg with the other. That boy you introduced to his innermost carnal desires last night is nothing but trouble. No trouble Peter couldn't handle, Betty Riley chuckled, fanning herself demonstratively. Aren't we all, madam, Peter declared, pouring himself coffee. You know, you couldn't have landed here at a worse time, Lulu, Lulu said. Betty gave me some idea, yes, Peter replied. Two months ago, that boy thought he was going to rule the frontier, was getting married, and look what you just put in his little old mind last night. Laughter erupted in the small breakfast room. He worked down at the fuel woodshed at the upper landing, played land speculator, both dried up, and now he's a wandering Irish drunk with his little, little old Catholic soul confused. Thanks to you. He's next door at Churns every day. I'd stay away from Churns for a while if I were you. Just taking it as it comes, Peter said, smiling at Betty. Couldn't ask for a better welcome. Well, a friend of Betty's is a friend of mine. The two of us together can come up with a place for you to land, Mr. Marks, Lulu decided. Now, what else is it you do besides break hearts? I thought I'd blacksmith for a time, Peter said. It suited me on the crossing. Betty, let's ask around. Thus, Peter's roots began to take. Soon, he was odd-jobbing his way around St. Paul. A traveling blacksmith, jack of all trades, that autumn to whom to whomever of Lulu's or Betty's clients needed a horseshoe, a fence, or a barn door hinge fixed, or a wagon wheel repaired, so its owner could get out of town before the next bank collapsed, or their business partner came after them with a shotgun. People rushing to get out of St. Paul before the river froze over was business that buttered Peter's bread. Thrilling Lulu, who felt age coming on, Peter rented the smaller of her two rooms there meaning Lulu need not be so lusty anymore. Lulu liked having a man around who wasn't a client. 
who began to feel like her own son after a while. She looked after Peter, a new boy in town who needed mothering. Peter accepted the pampering, still so weary from it all, the oncoming hibernation of winter a welcome relief. Before the first snow fell, Lulu took down the lusty Lulu sign from the front window, her retirement finally permanent. There, Peter began feathering another cocoon. From Lulu's, Peter learned his new home rhythms, keeping to himself. The whirlwind of Peter's Atlantic crossing, his first late summer night in town, was soon forgotten. Winter on the plain shocked Peter with its bite, coming quickly, brutally, and staying. The business of fleeing St. Paul dried up, leaving Peter with little to do but the occasional smithing out back in a tiny shack behind Lulu's. He earned just enough around town to keep paying rent. Peter went outside to face the frigid cold so to, to keep Lulu from having to do so, picking up food or firewood. Lulu kept Peter's cocoon absolutely perfect, never wanting him to find a reason to ever leave. Up in his room, Peter would lie in bed, listening to the wind howl and the snow pelt the window. Soon, the most work was keeping the house warm. The days shortened as the deep, icy black of Minnesota winter descended. By January 1858, a pattern of evening fireside chats set in after dinner before nighttime. Some nights, Betty would visit, rushing across the frozen town to burst in for a warm whiskey. Betty flirted relentlessly with Peter each time until they kept each other warm up in his room. Most nights, it was far too cold to walk across town, so Peter's evenings were spent listening at the fire to Lulu's tales of the frontier days when St. Paul was called Pig's Eye after that drunken Frenchman who kept a saloon in a cave on the riverbank. Ugliest man I've ever seen, Lulu always said, rocking back and forth near the fire. It's a good name for a town, Peter always replied. One eye, he had. One. The other one needed to go, too, Lulu laughed, and so on. Peter was happy to let Lulu talk, less of it for him. She needed to talk, and someone to listen. Thus, Peter learned all about St. Paul that first winter. Lulu knew not to pry. Recent arrivals in St. Paul were all chasing something or fleeing it or both, and they'd talk about it if they wanted to, and Peter didn't. One night in February 1858, winter's grip firmly forcing a restless cabin fever on everyone, Lulu finally broke some new ground with Peter in their evening chat. You been to that German saloon down the road, she asked one night, the fire crackling in the empty space where a word from Peter might land. She waited. They tell me German saloons are different. Peter took his cue. Oh, they are, Peter replied. A fine man, this German saloon keeper. You know the owner, Peter asked. Lulu rolled her eyes. In this business, honey, you know everybody, Lulu had to repeat. He's not one to visit the playpen, of course. A fine wife. He ran the fuel shed at the upper landing. Anton Waldman's his name. Just down that way, block or so, Lulu pointed. What's so different about a German saloon? Peter leaned back in his chair at the fire's glow permeating the tiny winter room. It's not like Shern's Oyster Shack, that's for sure, P Lulu, Lulu let Peter think. Watching for a signal that maybe now he'd open up just a bit. One knows one is in a German's business at a lager saloon. Is that so? It's more like this, Peter said. Like this room? Like that fire, Peter replied, pointing at the glow. How that fire fills this room with its light. That's how a German saloon works. Lulu was intrigued. You don't say. Lulu was getting somewhere. Having worn out running from himself, resting a winter away from it all, the piercing cold of the northern plains pushed Peter's Germanist back into him. There's a word in German, Peter explained. Deutsch Sturm. Deutsch Sturm, Peter taught. Deutsch Sturm means Germanness, a very specific sort of feeling. Waldman always struck me as very proper, Lulu nodded. His Sturm is probably quite fine, Peter chuckled. Oh, I'm quite certain no German would open a lager saloon here otherwise, Peter declared. Lager, you say? Bavarian-style beer, Peter said, much less heavy than the Irish or English sort, much more lively than those ales. Peter held up his glass of the evening's port to the light, looking through it. It has a special clarity. It's clean and a beautiful color, something to drink with food. They have food? Lulu asked. Madam, Peter began, one does not drink German lager without it. Lulu felt Peter barely eking out of his winter shell, and being a professional at such matters, she knew what to do. Why don't you take me to dinner at Walman sometime, Lulu asked. I watched that little go house go up over last year. I think one of the German stonemasons, what was his name, Amos or something, that man was laying that stone like he was building a church. I'd like to get a taste of this stum of yours. Peter laughed to himself. Lulu had got him, and he knew he'd been got. Perhaps it was time to meet some of St. Paul's Germans, finally. <laughs>
Why not, Peter announced. We will go soon. Oh, that's delightful, Lulu cooed, excited for an opportunity to be on display with a handsome young man for the first time in a long while. What shall I wear? I've never been I've never had German lager beer. We must get word to Betty. Oh, this is going to be lovely. She got up from her rocking chair, patted Peter on the back, knowing to take her winnings and run before he changed his mind. You decide when we have our stoom. Good night, Mr. Marks. Good night, Peter said, suddenly alone at the fire. He stepped to the front window, creaky with winter wind pounding onto it, to stare out at the night, readying himself. Out the window, the Minnesota plain stretched across frozen fields to his past, to who he was. After watching the snow for a minute or two, Peter turned to looking into the dying fire in the hearth, closed his eyes, and sighed. He went upstairs, got into bed, and the moment his head hit the pillow, Peter Marks slept more soundly that night than he had since he was a little prince in Prussia. All right, so there we have our first uh, love story uh, from Ghosts of Plum Run, part volume two, Serpents and Dust. Uh, our announcement is Waldman's. So uh, one of the joys of this project was finding actual buildings and places that still exist that were around at the time the first Minnesota mustered in as a regiment in St. Paul. Um, also the buildings that were around in Uniontown when the Second Corps was in Uniontown uh, right before Gettysburg. Um, but when I realized I had a German immigrant story on my hands, uh, I did a lot of research on St. Paul at German lager saloons and found one that actually still is there. Uh, built in 1857, uh, the building where Waldman's uh, saloon uh, began uh, and opened in the fall of 1857 was run by a fellow named Anton Waldman. And when I did the research, I found that uh, that building, uh, after 150 years of going from this to that, to the other thing, to disappearing into silence and quiet and rotting and nearly falling apart, was purchased by someone uh, in, uh, I think it was 2010, uh, 2008, 2005, something like that, um, by a fellow named Tom Schroeder. Tom uh, bought the building, started digging around inside the building, and discovered it was Waldman's Saloon. And now it's Waldman's Brewery. Tom Schroeder turned Waldman into a, a microbrewery. And it is one of the most beautiful uh, restored uh, buildings in the Midwest, uh, let alone St. Paul. And um, it's it's the only, it's the oldest st still standing commercial building in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and Tom has been extremely helpful to me for all the research on uh, uh, saloon life among Germans in St. Paul in 1857 uh, to 1861 uh, when the first Minnesota enlisted and mustered in for the Civil War. Um, Tom will be joining us on the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour for an interview. Uh, we're not sure when. Uh, the schedule for me reading uh, the chapter sort of leaves us in about a month with the chapter at Waldman's. <clears throat> so in the Ghosts of Plum Run series, including uh, volume one, Waldman's uh, plays a key role. All the good stuff happens at Waldman's. All, all the romance, all of the sparks flying, the fireworks happen at Waldman's because the thing is still there. So if you've lasted this long in this podcast, uh, you, are, you got the first uh, notice of that interview with Tom Schroeder from Waldman's Brewery. Um, if you're in St. Paul, you should visit. Um, it's, I'm sure the beer is great. I have not been yet. I'm sure I will someday. But thank you for joining us on the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour only on Midwestern Marks. I'm Tim Russo, author of the Star Wars series for leftists, Ghosts of Plum Run. And, and we'll see you next time.